ancient oral traditions speak of an early god fishing up the North Island of New Zealand with villages, people and crops intact, suggesting that Maui had fished up and discovered lands which were already occupied. The earliest creation myths of heaven and earth were recorded and passed down through oral tradition and speak of godlike people beautifying and sculpting significant areas of the coastline of the northern South Island. There is an ancient boulder bank breakwater anomaly in Nelson. Geologists cannot agree on how it could have formed naturally from sea drift granodiorite boulders. Nelson City could not exist without the seawall barrier, the sheltered harbour on one side and open sea on the other. It is a huge spit extending over 28 kilometres or 17.5 miles to Cable Bay. Numerous ancient quarry sites are found around Nelson region, along with vast ancient garden. Is the Nelson Boulder Bank New Zealand's equivalent of the 7,000 year old Adams Bridge linking Sri Lanka to India? There have been so many theories as to why it may be a natural formation, yet none are conclusive or bear much weight. Conversely, there are two well-known scientific studies on the bridge that lead modern science to believe that the structure may actually be man-made after all. In 2007, Dr. S. Badrina Rayanan, a former director of the Geological Survey of India, performed a survey of the structure and concluded with confidence that it was man-made. His team of divers and scientists physically examined the structure and discovered strong evidence of ancient quarrying in that specific area. Coral reefs are formed only on hard surfaces, but during the study we found that the formation at Adams Bridge is nothing but boulders of coral reefs. When we drilled for investigation, we found that there was loose sand two to three meters below the reefs. Hard rocks were found several meters below the sand. Such a natural formation is impossible. Unless somebody has transported them and dumped them there, those reefs could not have come there. Back in New Zealand, there are more anomalies occurring around the northern South Island. Just up the coastline from the Nelson Boulder Bank is Cable Bay and Pepin Island, linked by ancient anomalous breakwaters on two sides to provide a sheltered inner harbour. It is unknown how these barriers to the open sea formed naturally. A huge ancient population once lived here. And again at Wairau Bar in Blenheim, another boulder bank anomaly of unexplained origins. Twelve miles of hand-dug canals found within the inner harbour were built by the ancient Moa hunter people. The boulder bank barriers not only provided safe havens of sheltered harbours, but also abundant food to sustain large populations. Further to the west is Split Apple Rock in the Abel Tasman National Park, another anomaly that works as an accurate ancient solar observatory and is composed of high quality granite. On the northern coastline of New Zealand's South Island is a geological wonder that is world-renowned. Traditionally called Split Apple Rock, due to its appearance as a giant sliced in two apple. The giant boulder, given its height and fairly symmetrical round shape of about 18 feet in diameter, 
could weigh as much as 238 imperial tonnes or 242 metric tonnes. It appears to sit on a boulder pile composed of similar high quality hard granite components whereas the general material of the surrounding area is of a softer or more flaky composition totally unlike the split apple boulder or the platform boulders upon which it is cradled and housed. The evidence suggests very strongly that this is not a natural geological stack but a purpose-built one to serve an important astronomical and calendar function. This image shows just how immense this granite boulder actually is. Remarkably, there appear to be little or no similar examples of large, dense granite boulders strewn about anywhere within view, as one would reasonably expect to find. The general terrain of the area is predominantly a composite rock, made up of many varying elements. It is semi-hard and durable, but quite crumbly under pressure and could never be used for making stone blocks. Whereas the incredibly hard granite found on the split apple boulder was formed from molten magma under tremendous pressure far beneath the Earth's crust. The immediate vicinity, local terrain, is seemingly devoid of any known deposits of similar material. The giant split boulder sits on a boulder pile platform island that does not appear to be a natural rock upthrust, but more like a purpose-built, piled-up structure of high-quality, durable support boulders. The giant split apple also seems to be locked into position by chalk boulders to underpin, cradle and stabilise the two giant halves firmly into a set position and orientation. No one knows how this solid granite boulder came to be broken in half. Geologists offer a theory that water seeped into a crack in the rock during the Ice Age, causing it to split. But there has never been one skerrick of evidence to support this theory. Granite is an extremely common material used in stonework of many ancient cultures and is highly prized for its durability and strength. The split boulder forms a gun sight type V that points accurately at the vertical lower edge of the sea cliff, 330 feet or 100 metres away, at an angle approaching 59.5 to 60 degrees azimuth. From the beach viewing position, one visually aligns the base of the split apple V with the vertical edge of the cliff in order to form an accurate alignment onto the winter solstice first glint sunrise position. The sun, rising on a slight diagonal to the left, then climbs the edge of the cliff to launch itself into the sky from the cliff top. From the position of observation at beach level, the sea horizon conjuncts perfectly with the base of the V and first glint of the sun occurs low in the V. The first glint position seen at the base of the V represents the most northerly position the rising sun will move to in its annual journey up and down the eastern sea horizon and distant landmasses. Split Apple Rock also works perfectly for determining the equinox sunrises. Whereas the sun rises at 59.5 to 60 degrees azimuth at the time of the winter solstice, on the 21st of March autumnal equinox and 21st of September vernal equinox, it rises at 90 degrees. To accurately witness the two annual equinox events through the split apple V, one moves to a more westerly position of the beach. 
by viewing through the V to the ranges across the sea, situated at 90 degrees azimuth, the exact day of the equinox can be accurately fixed. At this point of the beach viewing position, the V in Split Apple Rock is half diminished in depth, but still highly visible and exploitable for cradling the equinoctial sun's orb. In the much magnified background is seen the distant range across the water, where the sun rises from a peak 1800 feet high. Here, the equinoctial sun is cradled in the base of the V after rising from behind the distant range. It then moves upwards into the morning sky on a slight diagonal to the north. It is very apparent that Split Apple Rock works perfectly as a solar observatory for both the winter solstice and equinoxes. It would also work fine for the summer solstice sunrise at 120 degree fix as well. Although the V would be much diminished and represented only by a small trough in the crown of the boulder as seen from the observer's position on the beach. On the occasion of the 2019 autumn equinox for the southern hemisphere, a supermoon rose almost exactly on the equinox line. This was a rare event not to be missed. On the evening of the equinox, the supermoon rose through the V of the split apple, very close to the solar equinox rise position, and is seen here cradled in the V. The supermoon of the 2019 equinox ascending upwards to the north to break free of the split apple V. This extreme northern position along the shoreline is where one would need to be in order to observe the summer solstice for the southern hemisphere, using split apple rock as the outer marker. The V aspect of the boulder is much diminished to only a concave trough, but would be sufficient for a finite fix on the sunrise. Alternatively, the right-hand base of the boulder could be used to capture first glint of the sun on the horizon, followed by its diagonal climb up the edge of the boulder to the trough position. On this line of sight, just above the beach, is a wide assembly flat area where ancient people could once have gathered for their summer solstice festivities. That expansive piece of terrain has not been subjected to modern day machine modifications as there would have been no access due to the steep hills behind. These are the three positions along the beach where ancient astronomer priests would stand to witness the significant annual solar days using the split apple outer marker and thus have the ability to keep their 365.25 day calendars completely correct. It seems obligatory that ancient savants would have marked the beach sighting positions with boulders or post markers, but centuries of storms and surging seas have now eradicated those positions. There is however one incised boulder left on the old track near the assembly area for the summer solstice. This ancient wayside track marker near the assembly plateau has three deeply incised lines running almost horizontally parallel, as well as a diagonal crossing line. It possibly relates to the Split Apple Observatory and its function where the summer solstice, equinox and winter solstice sightings take place. Incised boulders on trackways like this are encountered throughout New Zealand and seem to have served the function of directional markers that conveyed information for the ancient wayfarer. Almost all the area enclosed by the boundaries of the National Park 
is comprised of the grey-white separation point granite, which is thought to be about 100 million years old. There are few places where the quality of the rock is good enough for large blocks to stand quarrying without shattering. Outcrops of marble on the Pikikaruna range and granite at Tonga, Adel Island and Torrent Bay have been quarried for building stone. The nearest source of supply for high quality granite, durable enough to withstand the ever-present lashing of stormy seas, was seemingly Adel Island, three miles across the water to the north-northeast. Whereas there's nothing in the offering immediately adjacent, around the beach or cliffs where Split Apple Rock sits on its platform. It seems obligatory that the source of supply was Tonga Island, or its adjacent mainland, 10 miles further up the coast, where the quality of the stone was such that it gave rise to the establishment of a quarrying business. Stone from this quarry was used to build the New Zealand Parliament and Chief Post Office buildings in Wellington, as well as other stately public buildings in Nelson as elsewhere. Just north of the Tonga Bay stream is a 20 foot deep seaside cave, and on the back wall is this glyph, the upper central section of which clearly depicts split apple rock. To the glyph's right side is a deeply incised line that brushes past the boulder. There is also a central incised line that orientates towards the central V of the boulder, and a third line again orienting onto the V midsection. These deep incisions in solid hard granite are quite obviously telling the reader of the glyph that the giant split boulder functions on three alignments, namely summer solstice, equinox and winter solstice. Hovering over the split apple depiction is a very ancient solar glyph, found from ancient Ireland to Egypt, depicting the corona or halo of the sun at its solstice and equinox positions here are some examples. This is Curbstone K5 at Noath, the chambered Cian in Boyne Valley, County Meath, Ireland, which dates to about 3125 BC, which is over 5,000 years ago. The stone in its central spiral depicts the sun moving from its most northern to southern reaches of the horizon past the meridian or equinox on its endless journey. The two omega type glyphs to either side depict how to read the sun's rise and set positions to east and west, with the red sections representing the meridian fix and the end turnaround points representing the solstices. Seven solar orbs are seen at the top of the curbstone in homage to the sabbatical calendar method of seven solar days in a week, as well as monitoring the solar count based upon cycles of seven solar years. The Omega Glyph is depicted in statues or busts of Hathor of Egypt, who was a solar deity the two returning spirals depict the sun at its winter solstice and summer solstice positions, with the vertical line of the nose past the forehead representing the equinox. The many Celtic talk neck jewellery artefacts are in homage to the endless journey of the sun hence the gold colour and the pegasus winged horse flying from the solstice positions to the equinox throughout the year. The bulbous ends of the torque, other than representing the summer and winter solstices, also depict the morning sunrise to the east and afternoon sunset to the west. Amongst the Greeks, 
Pegasus horses featured prominently in the solar myths. Helios, the sun god of Greek mythology, rides his chariot across the sky each day, pulled by Pegasus winged horses. The ancient corona or halo glyph associated with many sun god depictions spanning several civilizations is most certainly seen to be hovering over the clearly incised split apple rock glyph. Incised lines point to the V of the glyph or to the split apple side. Given the immense effort and accomplishment to move the two halves of the boulder 10 miles down the coast and set it up on a platform of equally high quality granite boulders, it's little wonder the ancient astronomer sun worshippers would want to immortalise their accomplishment with this petroglyph at or near the site where the immense boulder originated. The region around Split Apple Rock, extending both up and down the coastline, was once host to a huge population who carved flat plateau and terraces into virtually every hill, peninsula or offshore island of the coastal region. The halo of early Coptic Christian art was derived from much earlier cultural myths, religions and gods. Petroglyphs or murals throughout the Mediterranean depict the passage of the sun god through the sky, as well as solar periods at and between the solstices and equinoxes. In the Greco-Palestinian picture to the left, the small orbs or knops around the head would represent solar day, week or month counts. To the right is seen a 6th century AD Coptic Egyptian Christian portrayal of Christ with the abbot Mena. Both are shown with halo sun orbs around their heads, with the one adorning the Christ figure, also including the encircled cross of Terranese, god of thunder and lightning, the precursor design or central element in the Celtic cross. The North Island of New Zealand is called, in the Maori language, Te Ika a Maui, the fish of Maui, and is represented as having been caught on a magical hook made from the jawbone of his grandmother, then hauled up from the deep by this ancient god of unknown origin. Quite surprisingly to some, the ancient Greek word for fish is ichthys, which is very phonetically similar to the Maori rendition of Ika. Each Maori word has to end in a vowel. In ancient languages, the soft sounds tend to recede from the language, whereas the hard vowels or consonants remain. For several centuries before the Christian epoch, Greco-religious iconography used the Alpha and Omega, first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, to represent fish symbols. Thus we have the Greek letters Alpha and Omega turned 90 degrees were anciently used as fish and fertility symbols, ichthys, in ancient Greek iconography. Centuries later, emerging Christianity adopted the fish symbol to represent their Messiah, Jesus, who was referred to scripturally as Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. By the 2nd century AD, Christians had adopted ichthys as the symbol for their deity. With Maori oral tradition mythologies, such as the legend of Mataoro and Niwarika, being an almost parallel story to the Greek myth of Orpheus and Eurydice, or Maori death afterlife myths being so similar to Greek and Celtic myths on many levels, it's unsurprising that both cultures half a world removed, share a near identical word for fish. The newly arriving Polynesian Maoris, circa 1300 AD, lived for about 10 generations alongside the earlier people and gleaned much from the long-term inhabitants who had occupied New Zealand for many thousands of years. Thus, numerous aspects of Maori culture or language show a pedigree back to ancient civilizations 
ranging from Egypt to India in one direction, or to continental Europe, the British Isles and Americas in the other direction. One of these cultural expressions that found its way to the very ends of the earth in New Zealand is the Egyptian Berber chin tattoo on women, which duplicates the traditional chin moko worn by Maori women and often of the same or very similar design features. From the Otago Witness newspaper of the 30th of December 1903 is the following. The sketch shows that the married women of this tribe, far up the Nile, are tattooed in a manner remarkably similar to that in which the Maori woman used to be tattooed, namely on the lips and chin, and now and again on the forehead. The article goes on to state that General Robley had found on some of the earlier Egyptian mummies certain ornamental designs which have hitherto been considered purely Egyptian but he finds that they are identical with some of the most ancient Maori patterns. The tattoo on the chin of this Berber girl, an ancient people indigenous to the northwest African Mediterranean or Atlantic coastlines, is reminiscent of the Amon Ra stick figure or squatting god found from Egypt to New Zealand. The same symbol is now used on the Berber national flag and represents the letter Z in their new alphabet. This neo tifanac script is based on the historical libico berber writing system used from an early antiquity by speakers of the Libyac languages throughout North Africa and on the Canary Islands. Most surviving texts and sources of that language are archaic funerary inscriptions on stone stelae and hard to date rock inscriptions which, since there are no bilingual Arabic texts found, indicates a general disuse of the alphabet before the arrival of the Arabs. However, the ancient alphabet survived as Tuareg Tifanac among the Tuareg people well into modern times, used primarily for games and puzzles, short graffiti, rock art and brief messages. The Amazia Berbers are cousins to the Gaunch of the Canary Islands and the Basque of the Pyrenees. A second glyph found in the Tonga Bay Cave, Tasman, New Zealand, depicts the same squatting, arms raised, Tifanac stick figure design, which is similar in many design features to the Egyptian hypocephalus funerary amulet of Amon Ra. The painted lips of the girl seem to represent the wide head of the figure. Regarding the Tonga Bay cave stick figure, the Archsite archaeological report states, Nearest the entrance is a human depiction such as an anthropomorph tiki figure, pecked with broad grooves, shallow and U-shaped about 5 cm wide, with a headdress raked down each side and with flecked stick-like arms raised to either side. There appear to be stick legs, height is about 65 centimetres and width with the flexed sticks about 110 centimetres. The position of the flexed stick arms is very similar to that of figures in some South Canterbury rock carvings. A somewhat more curvilinear depiction of the same stick figure design and using the tattooed lines around the lips to form a head for the squatting figure as found on this old painting of a Maori woman half a world away from Berber, northwest Africa. This particular tattoo moko design was widely adopted and adorned the chin and lips sections of many Maori women of the 19th century. For illustration, see Maori tattooing by Horatio Gordon Robley, 1896. Other similarities include the same two upright feathers as also depicted on the Egyptian god Amon Ra. The women of ancient Egypt wore a similar neck pendant to the greenstone tiki that adorns the Maori lady. The Egyptian pendants, generally carved from greenish blue turquoise or jade nephrite, were dedicated to Bess, the protector god of mothers and children and the tiki shown above was predominantly for women only and seems to have had the same protector god meaning. 
One of the oldest New Zealand tikis in the centre with the upright head is bracketed on each side by Egyptian pendants representing the protector dwarf god Bess. The one to the far left dates to about 330 BC and the one to the right could be considerably older. Egyptian women wore Bess pendants or had small Bess statuettes in their homes, especially where children were present. In mythology, Bess entertained, played music, danced for the children, killed snakes or scorpions, and stood between the children and any approaching strangers, vetting them for any hint of ill intent. If a threat was perceived, Bess would attack fiercely to protect the children. In New Zealand Maori mythology, there was a fearsome little dwarf god, and the Maori haka dance seems to have originally been a dance of Bess, indicating protection by the warriors of the women and children. A central element of the Maori haka dance is that the performers remain in a stooped or squatting dwarf-like position throughout, rolling, bulging eyes, flashing the tongue, grimacing in a fearsome or angry fashion, stomping the feet menacingly and evoking threats of death. This is a challenge to an enemy or stranger, in much the same way that the dwarf god Bess of Egypt is represented, with the same fearful attributes. To vet all comers in his role of protector god to pregnant women, mothers and children. In the Maori language of the 19th century, there were a series of compound words or references that inferred named the dwarf god, amongst other names, as ihi or wehi. This is very significant because in the Maori tongue there is no equivalent to the letters B and S, and the name Bess or Bessie would be rendered as ihi or wehi, as all Maori words must end with a vowel. The centre figure of the Egyptian hypocephalus funerary amulet is the squatting god Amon-Ra, the supreme deity of Egyptian religion and the sun god. He has staffs balancing on each knee, four ram's heads looking to the four quarters of the earth, and a plumed crown. In essence, many or most of the features are encapsulated in the Berber and Maori chin tattoo designs, albeit in a more simplistic rendition. The supreme god of Maoridom was the sky and sun god Ra, or Rangi. The squatting god is abundantly depicted in Moriori art of the Chatham Islands, a part of New Zealand. Inasmuch as the lips of Egyptian, Berber and Maori women were also tattooed, the lips also constituted a part of the full design and appear to be representative of the head of the squatting god in many traditional designs. The downwards pointing V configuration of the centre top lip beneath the nose would then duplicate the V chevron of the Moriori head design as well as the prominent V on the forehead of the Egyptian squatting dwarf god Bess, protector of mothers and children. The V is prominent on the forehead of all or most Maori totem carvings of figurines, tiki and protector god effigies that guard gateways and doorways. A similar figurine is found in the cultural symbolism of the Chehalis Indians of the Fraser River country, Pacific Northwest Washington, USA, and extending into Canada. Maori oral tradition tells us that the art of tattooing was taught to Maori by the Tūruhu, the former inhabitants of New Zealand. The Tūruhu also taught Maori the art of line dancing, called haka. It is interesting that the Egyptian word for tattooing is haku, which was also strongly associated with dancing. The Maori word haka haka also means deformed or stunted, one of the physical attributes of the dwarf god. The dwarf god is referred to by many names, one of them being haka matua. The squatting god figurines are found in profusion in very ancient cave or rock shelter art of New Zealand's South Island. The overall style seems to be a significant departure from the more recent eras of cultural symbolism and is probably very ancient. Similar stick figure designs are found in caves or on cliff faces of the American Southwest. The above picture is an artist's duplication of South Island New Zealand rock art. A story passed down in oral tradition speaks of Mata Ora, a Maori man, 
who married Niwarika, a Turuhu woman. One day, in a jealous rage, he beat her and she fled back to her family in the underworld. A very remorseful Mata'ora pursued her and begged Niwarika and her family for forgiveness. Mata'ora's plea was later accepted, and while in the underworld of the Turuhu, Mata'ora was taught the art of tattooing. He and Niwarika later returned to the overworld. The storyline is very similar to the Greek myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. The Maori film company that created pictures to include in their production represented the family of Niwarika correctly, in accordance with oral history descriptions of what the Turuhu looked like. Line dancing was also taught to Maori by the Turuhu, along with fishnet making and many other arts and crafts. Here are some comparisons between the design features of Tutankhamun's death mask and an early era Maori moko. Both societies were sun worshippers and the names for their supreme gods were Ra and Rangi, respectively. Number 1 on the mask of Tutankhamun, there is an odd number of blue lapis lazuli stripes on one side of the forehead compared to the other, separated by the gold band body of the cobra. Five stripes to the left and four to the right. The same oddity holds true on the forehead area of the Maori chief's moko. If we count the dark eyebrows as stripes, then there are six dark stripes to the left and seven to the right, 13 in total. Alternatively, if we count the lighter skin, non-tattooed parts between, there are six stripes to the left and seven to the right. However, the centre vertical, untattooed stripe is also counted, bringing the total of light stripes to 14. It is significant that 13 times 14 equals 182, which is the number of full days between equinoxes, or half the number of full days in the 365.25 day year. Number 2. At the top of the centre band of the Maori moko is the fleur-de-lis symbol, based upon the lotus flower, which is the national flower of Egypt. This usage of the lotus flower symbol, extended from ancient Egypt and its adjacent country, Canaan Israel, where it was prominently displayed in the Hebrew Temple of Solomon. The fleur de lis symbol was used by the Berber people in some of their ancient or traditional tattoos and was adopted by French royalty. On the centre band, below the fleur de lis, is a crossbar, and below that is a figure eight. This overall symbol represents the very ancient caduceus, which has become our modern day medical symbol. The figure eight is the intertwined snakes of the caduceus, and in biblical mythology, Moses is said to have raised a staff of this near design, called the bronze serpent, to cure his people from deadly snake bites. See Numbers 21, 6-9. The mask of Tutankhamun shows the same two snake-like elements in the centre of the forehead, namely the long neck and head of the vulture and the squirming body of the cobra. Under the elaborate mask, King Tutankhamun has the exact same figure-eight design depicting two intertwined cobra snakes embroidered into the top and front of the linen skull cap on his head. Number 3. There are many more comparable elements in both designs, but suffice it to say that the rest of the Maori moko shown here is all about the sun's movement from the summer solstice, past the equinox, then winding into the winter solstice. This endless journey of Ra or Rangi is depicted from the cheeks, past the dog star symbol, dog head meaning Sirius, seen here in the approach to the nose, past the nose centre ridge equinox to the other solstice cheek centre. The sun's endless journey is also depicted in the tattoo circumnavigating the mouth, which perfectly duplicates the ancient Celtic inwards facing dual spiral torque design. 
Number combinations represented by sections of stripes on Tutankhamun's mask multiplied by other sections revealed scientific numbers related to durations in time, day, month, year counts, for cyclic astronomy, etc. The explanation for which would be too large for this article. The Moko tattoo portrait of the young Maori chief was painted by George Angus in 1844, a time when Maori cultural symbolism was executed in a pure, traditional fashion as handed down from the ancestors. This is the Celtic god, Sununos, or Sun, or Hearn, the hunter god of Celtic mythology. Just as Indra of the Indo-Aryans later metamorphosized into the German god Wotan, the Norse god Odin, or Thor, the French Scottish god Terranis or Taranak, the Greek Celtic god Zeus or the Roman god Jupiter, so too other gods in slightly altered form have pedigrees back to earlier civilizations. One of these was the Celtic god Sununos, who by his displayed attributes shows a connection to ancient Egypt. He is seen with talks, showing he was monitoring the annual seasonal positions of the sun between solstices and equinoxes. He displays a striped forehead design that duplicates both Tutankhamun's mask as well as the tattooed Maori moko. The counts of forehead stripes or antler barb tines in Furluni Solar sabbatical calendar counts based upon the number seven. Alternatively, the Celtic equivalent to Thor, god of thunder, is Taranese or Taranag. The Scottish word Taranag, rendered in the Maori tongue, which has to end in a vowel, is Taranaki, was also represented amidst the gods of early New Zealand. He was appeased by fire, loud claps of thunder and flashes of lightning. The majestic New Zealand volcano, Taranaki, bears his ancient name. A well-preserved totem dedicated to Taranese and his unique attributes was found in a New Zealand swamp. It bore the cross of Taranese, which was the central part of his thunder wheel his lightning bolt and his double spirals. Taranaki, Tawaki, New Zealand's ruddy red-skinned god of thunder and lightning, associated with the colour red, volcanic fires, lava flows, the very ancient European tribes migrating all the way to Britain left a trail behind them of Tara, derived names. The ancient hill of Tara in County Meath, Ireland, according to tradition, was the inauguration place and high seat of the kings of Ireland. Atop the hill is a chambered cairn. Adorning the wall are depictions of the cross or thunder wheel of Taranese, god of thunder and lightning. In the ancient language of New Zealand, it is evident that the term Tara or Taran meant thunder. Given that this was the meaning of the name all over the northern hemisphere, it is not surprising that another volcano in New Zealand was named Tarawera another majestic volcano, which would mean red thunder. Volcanoes epitomise the attributes of the god Taranese. The former inhabitants used volcanoes throughout New Zealand as the outer markers for solar observatories, 
for solstices and equinoxes in an effort to keep calendars 100% correct by returning fire to the volcano on the significant days of the year. The Hittite term Turhu, which very closely resembles Turuhu, the name of the former inhabitants of New Zealand, has very close links to the term Taranese in etymology. The term Shining Ones is actually taken from the most ancient sacred pyramid texts of Egypt in hieroglyphs and has to do with the archaic remnants of an earlier culture which gave birth to the Egyptian civilization. The palette of Palermo, one of the most archaic artifacts that survived from early days of Egyptian dynasties, lists a number of Libyan princes as rulers before the first pharaoh of Egypt. The general term applied to the Turuhu people in New Zealand was the Shining One, Children of Heaven, Children of Light, Light-giving family, and much later after their conquest, having fled into the hinterland, they were called the Children of the Mist. The Urawera mountain range was a well-known haunt of the ancient Turuhu Tuhoe people. After they had been conquered and had fled into the hinterlands, the meaning of Urawera would mean Uru, the red or gleaming one, descriptive of their fair complexion and red hair. Urukehu and Kiri Pufero were the terms used by Maori to describe the physical appearance of the earlier people, and this means people of fair skin and red or blonde hair. This is the Tonga Bay Quarry Company's work and dwelling buildings. They were in operation starting in 1904 when the company flourished for a decade until about 1914, then wound down its operations and was finally struck off the register of companies in 1921. At Tonga Island, or on the adjacent mainland, large bulbous boulders similar in size to Split Apple Rock can still be seen at the water's edge below the steep cliffs. Geological analysis of the constituent composition of the split apple boulder would pinpoint the source from which the massive boulder was acquired. The fact that the V in the split boulder orientates perfectly onto the winter solstice sunrise point at the greatest extremity of the sun's northern journey, coupled with the platform cradle into which the boulder has been carefully placed and chocked, allowing the base of the V to conjunct simultaneously with the more distant cliff edge and the sea horizon, demonstrates that this is a purpose-built structure and not a natural occurrence. Added to this, the base platform upon which Split Apple Rock sits has been engineered with such precision that the giant Split Apple halves appear to float on top of the water at high tide. The opportunity is certainly there for geologists to study this anomaly and arrive at a definitive conclusion as to exactly where the boulder came from. But under the present, politically correct impositions that dominate and restrict all New Zealand archaeology, this won't happen. As for the summer solstice sunrise position, as witnessed from the beach observation point, from which the winter solstice and equinox events are viewed through the split apple V, that would occur across the water on the high range that divides Nelson and Marlborough provinces. From the split apple rock beach observation position, the summer solstice line would extend across the range to resolve at Wairau Bar, where there was a large moa hunter settlement conceivably centuries or even thousands of years before Maori arrived on New Zealand shores. Like the Celts of ancient Europe, the pre-Maori people of New Zealand set up solar paths for the wayfarer. Based upon the equinox and solstice rise and set positions, in order to travel accurately between coastal settlements on both sides of the North and South Islands. 
The ancient inhabitants of Wairau Bar lived contemporaneously with many species of the now long extinct moa birds and were even buried with moa eggs and moa bone necklaces amongst their grave goods. These burials were obviously long before the Polynesian Maori arrived on these shores. Politically aligned New Zealand social engineer academics adhere to an entrenched policy that no one had ever lived in New Zealand or even discovered it prior to the circa 1300 AD arrival of Eastern Polynesian Maori. Although originally touted before the public as being the first Eastern Polynesian settlement in New Zealand, the experts vacillate on the centrally moot point the fact that moa eggs, moa bones and moa bone necklaces were found amongst the grave goods poses a big problem and every creative ploy possible has to be conjured up to drag the dates of habitation into the Maori epoch. Such things as suggesting the original settlement was composed of a tiny group of about seven people, including women, washed up during the mid-1200s due to a drift mishap, seeded and colonised the entirety of New Zealand within 100 years is absurd. The ridiculous, unworkable population model proffered by our mainstream experts tells us in a country 10% larger in landmass than Great Britain, with a moderate subtropical climate and vast tracts of virgin forest, Maori are claimed to have wiped out all species of the giant and smaller moa birds in the 100 years after 1250 AD. They found a very high quality ads making stone hundreds of miles away from Wairau Bar and produced thousands of adzes from that source that were then distributed over the entirety of New Zealand. The Tahunga Hill adzes are found in the grave goods of New Zealand's oldest burials, including the drift mishap generation of Wairau Bar, allegedly dating to only 1250 to 1300 AD. The same holds true for finely manufactured greenstone artefacts. The stone found at only one remote, mountainous location, but distributed over 268,838 square kilometres of New Zealand. There were also many other vast quarrying enterprises for all manner of special tooling or decorative stones or obsidian for knives, again found at only a few limited locations, but distributed in every direction. There are over 5,000 registered pa, fortresses and other huge excavations in heavily sculpted hills, including the 36 volcanic rock hill cones of the Auckland Isthmus and outlying islands. There were also amphitheatres, canal systems, huge wetlands gardening complexes. Between 1250 AD and the dawn of British colonisation at the beginning of the 1800s, Maori would not have had the manpower to build even 1% of what's found across the vast New Zealand landscape. The proffered academic population model absurdities go on and on and it is unworkable in the extreme. With the Wairau Bar and elsewhere, scientifically dated samples locked away from public view, our experts are now resorting to gobbledygook and doublespeak to cover their proverbial asses before the public. 
the dates used by Wilmhurst were from eggshell dates from Wairau Bar, Higman et al., 1999, that had a similar probability span as the more recently obtained dates and that the 1280 CE date suggested was based upon the tail of the probability curve, which is not an indicator of the temporal span of the site. Oh, poo. As Forrest Gump might have said, Gosh, they must be real educated folk to talk like that. Archaeological evidence of human-made artefacts and cooked moa bones found beneath the volcanic ash band layer at Pukawa Hawks Bay, as well as dating from the circa 1350 BC Waimahia explosion about 3,400 years ago, attests to very early moa hunter inhabitants of New Zealand. When 13-year-old Jim Isles made the discovery of a skull and grave goods at Wairau Bar in 1939, it led to the site being considered the most significant find in New Zealand archaeological investigations up until that time or since. In reference to skeletons exhumed, Rangatani Maori elder Manny MacDonald said, It's nothing to do with us. He's not one of us. This kind of freely proffered admission used to be common and prevalent amongst the learned Maori elders. Historian Edward Tregear observed, The Maoris used to pay great respect to the bones of their dead. Yet here and there may be found among sand hills, etc., human remains uncovered by the wind, and of these no tradition remains as there would certainly be if the relics were those of ancestors. The natives say these are the bones of strangers, so also mortuary caves are found concerning the contents of which the Maoris make the same remark and regard them with indifference. In an article written for the Tasmanian Journal of Science in 1842, CMS mission printer William Colenso wrote about the lack of knowledge Maori had concerning the giant moa birds. From native tradition, we gain nothing to aid us in our inquiries after the probable age in which this animal lived. For although the New Zealander abounds in traditionary law, both natural and supernatural, he appears to be totally ignorant of anything concerning the moa, save the fabulous stories already referred to. If such an animal ever existed within the time of the present race of New Zealanders, surely to a people possessing no quadrupeds and but very scantily supplied with both animal and vegetable food, the chase and capture of such a creature would not only be a grand achievement, but one also, from its importance, not likely ever to be forgotten. Seeing too that many things of minor importance are by them handed down from father to son in continued succession from the very night of history, even fishes, birds and plants, anciently sought after with avidity as articles of food, although having never been seen by either the passing or rising generation of Aborigines, are notwithstanding both in habit and uses well known to them from the descriptive accounts repeatedly recited in their hearing by the old men of the village. Taking then the paucity of tradition as he supposed it, together with such other facts as he found them, Mr Colenso came to the conclusion that the period of time, then, in which I venture to conceive it most probable the moa ceased to exist, was certainly either antecedent or coetaneous to the peopling of these islands by the present race of New Zealanders. Likewise, Julius von Haast drew the same conclusion after considerable research and interviews conducted with Maori in the South Island. The solar observatory-related attributes of Split Apple Rock, as well as the huge engineering feat to set it up, has nothing recognisable to the known endeavours of the late-arriving Polynesian Melanesians, 
and undoubtedly stems from an altogether different age and people who occupied New Zealand at a far more remote epoch. Some of the earliest inhabitants of the South Island were known as the numerous Kui people. They were later annihilated by Tutumayo and Mairoro, who were giants from unknown islands of the Pacific. Tutumayo, in turn, were destroyed by the Tūruhu, who were universally described as being a fair people with red or blonde hair. Like their contemporaries, the Patapairuhi, Poniaturi, Pairangi, Natuha, and finally another race of large statured people, the Kahui Tipua giants. The late arriving Maori lived alongside the Tūruhu for 10 generations before warfare finally saw the demise of the Tūruhu. Again, at Kaiteriteri Township, is yet another Cairn heap of natural boulders. They could have been purpose modified to act as a component part of yet another winter solstice sunrise observatory. The Cairn heap sits 1.18 miles down the coast from Split Apple Rock and serves the same exacting function as the cliff edge onto which Split Apple Rock orientates for fixing onto the winter solstice. Although a perfectly natural geological formation, conveniently the heap center, composed of a giant upright boulder, sits once again about 330 feet or 100 meters from a V formed by an onshore bluff peninsula and offshore island. A winter solstice observation line runs from the beach area of Kaiteriteri Township, passes through the V-gap between the island and headland, and resolves to the shoreline side of the Cairn Heap's high centre. An aerial shot of the winter solstice sun making its first glint appearance over the sea horizon at Kaiteriteri. By observing from the beach Station 1, viewing through the V Station 2, using the side of the boulder cairn for accurate orientation Station 3, and watching the winter solstice sunrise Station 4, the Kaiteriteri Township modus operandi duplicates that of the Split Apple Rock Solar Observatory further up the coast. As I witnessed the winter solstice through natural geological features, once utilised by New Zealand's ancient inhabitants, to capture the significant annual event. Very near to the position one needs to be at to witness this annual phenomenon are two bullorn bowls, carved into very durable crystalline boulders, sitting at the high tide mark. In ancient Europe, such bullorns would have been used for ritual prayers on a blessing and cursing altar. Modern day Kai Territory residents are oblivious to the fact that they have this archaeological astronomical treasure sitting on their seafront doorstep. I had the entire breathtaking moment all to myself and was witnessing something that has been lost from memory an ancient working solar observatory that has escaped recognition for centuries or millennia. The warming rays of the sun bath the frigid waters of the bay creating a path of steamy mist. Whereas the split apple observatory provided a very finite fix on the winter solstice, suitable for an astronomer priest to determine the actual solstice day for the benefit of the regional community, the Kai Territory Observatory would provide a magnificent spectacle to the general population where large numbers could gather together to witness and celebrate the solar event. And here, Martin is observing an ancient Bullorn bowl filled with seawater and cut deeply into very hard crystalline rock. This bowl, 
and a second one nearby are situated at the position where the sun is seen to rise in the gap in the background at the time of the winter solstice. This region of the beach would have been an assembly area for the rank and file of ancient Patapari Turuhu society to celebrate the significant solar event of midwinter. The tide washes into the bowls twice a day and in keeping with known practices elsewhere, this was a place for ritual cleansing as well as blessing prayers or cursing incantations. The use of bullorn bowls for religious purposes represented profound religious expressions of ancient European Mediterranean civilizations, and those practices persist to this day in areas of Ireland. The second bullorn at the assembly area. Adjacent to this is a boulder with directional incising on it. And here, Martin is inspecting the second bullorn. In the foreground, the hard boulder is seen to have a straight line geometric pattern incised into its top surface. One line seems to orientate onto the headland and island gap where the winter solstice sunrise occurs. Other lines seem to relate to the equinox and summer solstice sunrise points or sunset points on the distant range across the harbour, on the eastern range or another nearby range to the west. A close-up of some of the incised geometry, which undoubtedly relates to the solar rises on the distant eastern range and at least some solar set positions on the nearer western range. Here is an example of the same kind of directional incising as found on an ancient boulder formerly at Silverdale, Auckland in the North Island. The boulder has now been destroyed to make way for a subdivision. Note the wide, long incising mark traversing through the centre of the other geometry. This boulder sat in full view of Chin Hill, with its huge ancient V cut into its southern side. Observing the solstices and equinoxes assured everyone that their calendar counts throughout the year remained true, such that planting and harvesting of crops was done on time, or determining when fish and bird migrations could be expected to commence Regulating life by accurate calendars gave ancient populations the best possible chance of survival and enjoying abundance. Taupo Point Pa, Solar Observatory in Golden Bay. Travelling northwest around the coastline from Kaiteriteri and Split Apple Rock, one bypasses Separation Point Lighthouse to the west of which is a place of ancient habitation called Taupo Point Pa. On December the 19th, 1642, warriors, seemingly from this pa, canoe rammed a rowboat containing Dutch sailors of Abel Tasman's exploratory expedition, resulting in four men being beaten to death by Maori or drowned. Abel Tasman then named the area Murderer's Bay and sailed away. The sign that sits at the former position of Taupo Point Pa, showing an artist's impression of how the site looked in 1844. A traditional Maori saying or proverb associated with this site is Taupo sleeps beneath the sun, where are the people of the past? Note that whenever the term tangata whenua was uttered or written throughout the 19th century and most of the 20th century, it always meant the strangers, Patapairi, Turuhu, etc., who inhabited New Zealand before the circa 1300 AD epoch of the Polynesian Melanesian Maori. A Department of Conservation article devoted to this region at the northern end of the South Island touches upon legends of pre-Maori inhabitants. Maori cosmology and creation myths tell of predecessors of the earliest inhabitants of the region. 
Traces of their passing remain in the features of the landscape and names they have been given. Let's look at some of the handiwork left by the earlier people and the function of some landscape features as solar observatories for getting accurate sun fixes on significant calendar dates. The winter solstice sunset observed from the sighting pits of Taupo Point Pa. Around New Zealand, many so-called Pa, or settlements, created by the Patapari people, doubled as solar observatories. And Taupo Point Pa was no exception to this. Oft times, these sites could not realistically serve the function of a defence area, so must have been built for another purpose. Although the Hillock Peninsula is now thickly clad in trees, the former purpose-built excavations were identified in an archaeological survey of the site by archaeologist Barry Brailsford. Amongst these dug features were sighting pits where observers could sit in a set or fixed position of orientation. The archaeological report of 1972 assessed the hillock site as being unsuitable for defence and states, a very suitable site for a kainga, but hardly defendable as a pa, especially for its small size. The report went on to note, limestone outcrops make occupation unlikely. So as long as no enemy was threatening, the area would have been a wonderful place to live long term, with abundant sea resources and a microclimate that produces, on average, more annual sunshine and clear days than other regions of New Zealand. A little over 19 miles to the northwest of Taupo Point, on the range above Collingwood Township, is this outstanding geological feature, which would represent a perfect outer marker target for a winter solstice sunset. The hill is part of the Northwest Nelson Conservation Park. While exploring the region at the time of the winter solstice, I was intrigued to see the sun almost alighting on this hill and took several photos as a consequence. The setting winter solstice sun overshoots the gunsight shaped hill on the Collingwood Range, which means that if the ancient astronomers wished to use the centre hill as an outer marker for the winter solstice fix, their observation point or station would have to be on an alignment that sat slightly further to the north. By back calculating the required angle, we found the position. A line of sight runs from the sighting pits atop Taupo Point Pa Hillock to the centre of Collingwood's outstanding hill up on the range. Calculations undertaken in Redshift Astronomy Programme verified that the sun would land in the centre of the Collingwood Hill, 19.5 miles distant at 301.66 degrees on the evening of the winter solstice, as witnessed from the observer's position atop Taupo Point Pa. Yes indeed, Taupo sleeps beneath the sun. Where are the people of the past? They are long gone now, vanquished from the region and not allowed to be remembered. But their working, sophisticated solar observatories yet remain as an eternal witness to Patapairihi society's presence and deep-set cultural practices. Our old 19th century New Zealand history books quote many of the oral histories recounted by the tohunga and learned elders of the Maori of old and are replete with references to the long-term inhabitants and in coming Maori found when they arrived. These solar observatories at Kai Territory, Split Apple Rock and Taupo Point are the handiwork of the ancient former inhabitants and could be several thousand years old. Let's now move to yet another Taupo in the central North Island of New Zealand and look at some other solar observatories tested during the Southern Hemisphere winter solstice of 2018. On the shores of Lake Taupo at Foriwaka, a new subdivision was created in 2004 and during entry road widening onto the site, a giant boulder 
had to be moved out of the way. Local educator historian Graham Parmenter alerted Martin to the fact that the giant boulder had what is very obvious to all who see and inspect it carefully, a human carved seat in it. Prior to 2004, the carved seat had faced the centre cone of Mount Tauhara, a dormant, lofty volcano that dominates the skyline to the east-northeast. This anomaly has led Martin to research and do concentrated probes of the district, making further amazing discoveries related to this boulder, or Devil's Chair as it would be called in Ireland, and its position of placement as an overland alignment surveying position. The giant boulder lying recumbent on its side with the carved seat formerly at the top of the boulder, now seen at the bottom in this picture. The chair is also a component part of an overland mapping alignment that extends from Mount Edgecombe near Kaurau on the east coast to Taupo and across the top of the Devil's Chair, then over Mototaiko Island in the middle of Lake Taupo, then over the summit of volcano Mount Tongariro, the survey line extends to the South Island, skirting past Kaiteriteri Township at a point 15 miles south-southeast, then resolves on Mount Cook, the highest mountain in New Zealand. Sitting 611 feet away, southeast from the Devil's Chair Boulder, is a secondary standing stone site of large obelisks and from experience with other sites around the country or continental Europe, Mediterranean, British Isles, etc. This could be described as an assembly area for the general population where they could gather together to celebrate festival events or learn cyclic astronomical and navigational knowledge under the tutelage of a highly trained instructor. Centrally positioned amidst the standing stones is a particularly large one, which because of its size is recognisable as the hub stone or centre of the site. From that position, the winter solstice sun rises perfectly from the very centre of the extinct volcano, Mount Tauhara. Around New Zealand, there are many such occurrences where the ancient pre-Maori inhabitants set up solar observatories, and where possible, the outer marker for sunrise or sunset was a volcano. This was their way of returning fire to the volcanoes at equinoxes or solstices, and in the process, keeping their annual calendar counts 100% accurate. They were also a people who venerated the sun or sun god, and solar events were of great importance to them. Our pre-calculations in the astronomy program Red Shift were right on the button, and the sun rose perfectly from the centre crater of extinct volcano Mount Tauhara, when viewed from the central hubstone of the assembly area. Just like at Kaiteriteri Solar Observatory, the winter solstice sun finally obscured the outer mark of volcano in a blaze of blinding light. On the top of the hubstone boulder, from which Mount Tauhara was targeted, there appears to be a now somewhat broken balloon bowl carved into the surface. For auspicious occasions, such as the winter solstice celebration, this would have been filled with water. In ancient Ireland, as elsewhere in megalithic Great Britain or continental Europe, the bullorns were used for ritual washing or prayers and were carved into the blessing and cursing altar boulders around 3000 BC and after. To the right of the picture is seen Mount Manganamu, Mosquito Mountain, and from the same standing stone circle's hubstone, the equinoctial sun rises at its southern base, then climbs up the side of the mountain to launch itself into the sky. From the hubstone and very carefully placed assembly area outlier boulders, Manganamu was the equinox sunrise outer marker. 
Whereas first glint of the sunrise on the winter solstice is precisely in the cone of Mount Tauhara, at the equinox it is at the southern base of Manganami Mountain. The sun then climbs the mountainside and launches itself into the sky. The southern base of Manganami Mountain provided a perfect fix for determining the exact day of both the autumnal or vernal equinox days. This is the hub stone from the top of which our sunrise and sunset images were shot. We also used a camcorder on a tripod at the base of this stone. The winter solstice sun alights upon a hill atop the range situated above Acacia Bay and its blinding light obscures its very important landing position. To the left of the picture is seen the tower atop Tuhingamata Hill where there is yet another solar observatory marked by obelisks that uses Mount Tauhara as an equinox outer marker. This purpose placed obelisk set of large component boulders was found by researcher Mark Gabriel and from this observation position the equinoctial sun is seen to rise from the southern base of volcano Mount Tahara, where the sun climbs to the summit in exactly the same way as the equinox rise on Mount Manganamu is seen from the hubstone on the shore of Lake Taupo. The winter solstice sun alights upon a hill atop the range, then slips down into a dip on the hill's southern side. There are apparently Maori legends and oral traditions about the great importance of the hill, but no one seems to know why it is so important. Now that we know it was the outer marker for the winter solstice sunset, chosen by the ancient pre-Maori astronomers Ngāti Hotu, its importance becomes clear. The equinoctial sun sets on the distant range. In line with the extreme end of Rangatira Point, the ancient location of Ponui Pa, rays from the sun extend toward the hubstone of the standing stone circle and cross over the top of another outlier standing stone used for orientation onto the equinox sunset point on the horizon. The ancient standing stone arrangement on the shores of Lake Taupo, abandoned and not used for the avowed purpose for which it was built, since the original inhabitants were driven from the region by incoming Arawa and later Tuwharitoa Maori warriors. The newcomers seemingly never gleaned or gained knowledge of how the site worked or its significance. The central large boulder, seen towards the hillock summit, is the hubstone, and in keeping with how other standing stone sites work overseas, the positions of outliers are at coded distances and angles away from it. The encoded measurements and angles themselves relate to such things as the lunar cycle durations, lunar solar calendar calculations, the equatorial circumference of the Earth under two systems of ancient navigation, as well as solstice and equinox solar observations, which are essential to keeping the calendar 100% accurate. The key to unlocking the codes of this site is in the realisation that the British standard inch and foot have a much older pedigree than that assumed by our so-called experts and are in direct ratio to the cubits of the great civilizations of antiquity. Code-bearing numerical values are also generated by use of the ancient 360-degree angle system attributed to the Sumerians but which is in reality much older than that civilization. For a comprehensive analysis related to the encoded attributes of what survives of this standing stone arrangement and its distant, purpose-placed outlier boulders, see Celtic NZ.